Okay, I think we got started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm really glad that the uh, three speakers came out because, with the economic crisis being as it is, they might have opted out of the debate tonight. Um, um, tonight, we're going to have um, a conversation um, about um, the way in which the brain sciences um, have contributed to an understanding of the mind sciences. Um, and this is really a field which, in some sense, is new, but not necessarily that new. Um, it's a discipline of an interaction between the cognitive sciences and neurosciences that one could see as starting somewhere around 1992, um, maybe a little earlier. Um, and it depends on kind of how you think about the interaction between the neurosciences and the um, cognitive sciences. Um, areas such as neuropsychology, which really did look at how damage to certain parts of the brain influenced certain kinds of psychological processing, are much, much older. Um, but for many, the sort of the, the field of cognitive neuroscience, which really is the uh, interlinking between cognitive and neurosciences, um, many people want to anchor when the imaging technologies began to come online and began to really contribute to how we can study not just the damaged brain, but the normal brain doing various kinds of psychological um, processes. Um, it's an interesting area in part because um, the three people tonight who are going to lead this off, uh, Steve Koslin, Dan Schachter, um, and Alfonso Karamazza are three of the people who were really uh, important in the history and development of the cognitive neurosciences. Um, and each of them really dealing with um, quite different psychological phenomena. So the way we're going to deal with this tonight is that um, Steve Koslin will start off, um, who, as many of you know, has for a very long time um, looked at aspects of human mental imagery. Um, then we'll uh, turn to Dan Schachter, um, who will talk to us about the work on memory. And then we'll finish with Alfonso Karamazza talking about um, work on language. So the idea is that each of them will give about a 20-minute um, presentation to show you some of the advances that have been made in those specific areas um, and how they see um, the brain sciences contributing to understanding of the mind sciences. Um, and then we'll uh, engage them uh, first by myself. We'll engage uh, the three of them in a conversation about the material that was discussed tonight as well as some other implications. And then we'll leave probably about 15 or so minutes for questions that you might have on the issues that have been raised. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Mark. Is there a pointer? Is there a pointer there? Uh, no pointer? Other people come for her quick. Right, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let's see if I can get Dan's computer to do my bidding. Yes. Um, I'm going to be talking about mental images. Uh, let me see if I can give you a sense of what it is I'm talking about, or rather have you give yourself a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, do you know what shape Mickey Mouse's ears are? Can you answer the question? OK, good. Which is darker green, spinach or iceberg lettuce? Excellent. In which hand, here's a hard one, in which hand does the Statue of Liberty hold the torch? Okay. So did you have the experience of sort of viewing the rodent's head when you were trying to decide what shape its ears are and so forth? So that's the experience of mental image, but it's not what I mean by a mental image. What I'm talking about is the representations that give rise to that experience. Um, the key question that's plagued this field since the beginning is, is there a sense in which visual mental images are pictures in the head? Now, this is kind of a naughty notion, naughty in the sense of knots in a tree, not naughty like naughty, um, in that who would look at the pictures? Um, where does the light come from? And isn't it kind of uncomfortable having a picture in your head anyway? Um, questions like this have given the notion of mental imagery kind of a bad odor. I mean, there's a long history uh, where for example, most recently, 1913 or so, uh, Watson, one of the founders of behaviorism, used imagery as his primary whipping boy, claiming that, in fact, we have no such thing as mental images. All thought is verbal. It's very subtle movements of the larynx. Um, and it's gone back and forth, in part because mental imagery, by definition, is a private event. I mean, if one of you raised your hand and said, I didn't have the experience of a mental image when I answered those questions, how could I show you were right or wrong? It's by definition something internal that until very recently was accessible only via introspection, only via looking within. So part of what I've dealt with is trying to figure out ways to study mental imagery objectively. First, let me get a little clearer on what I'm going to be addressing. Uh, the issue is if you take some content, like a ball is on a box, 
you can represent that in various different ways. So there's no issue about visual information being stored. That has nothing to do with the issue at hand. The issue is when you have that experience of a mental image, there's something that's in some sense picture-like going on in your head. That's really what the issues come down to. So we can be much more formal about that. I don't have time to go through all this in detail, but you can see that we can distinguish between the types of representations, sort of depictive versus more descriptive. And we can do that relatively formally. The key idea of what distinguishes this kind of representation from this kind is that space is used to represent space. So each point on this representation corresponds to a point on the actual object such that the distances between the points in the representation correspond to the distances on the actual object. So you're using a kind of mental space to represent external space. That's what we mean by depiction. We can get quite clear about this, which I don't have time to do. But this is the key idea. Depictive representations, distances among points in the representation correspond to distances among points in the surface of the corresponding object. So how are we going to try to demonstrate that when you have the experience of a mental image, there's a representation underlying it that looks like that, okay, that has those kind of properties. So the alternative is it's all kind of language-like, and the experience is epiphenomenal. It's like the heat from a light bulb when you're reading. The heat plays no role in the reading process. People have claimed that the experience is entirely epiphenomenal, and all mental work is done with a single language of thought that's essentially language-like. So the issue is, is there more than one language of thought? Are there at least two, one of which is depictive, which is a different kind of form of representation as opposed to linguistic. Clearly, there's linguistic representation. So first set of experiments that at least I did used behavioral met methods that used response times and error rates as a way to try to externalize what was inside the head. So here's one experiment. Try this, actually. Close your eyes. Um, imagine uh, Snoopy the dog and focus your mental gaze on his feet. Can you do that? Okay, now tell me whether his ears stick up or they hang down. Okay, well, if I had measured the time for you to make that decision, you would have taken more time than if I'd asked you to start off focusing on the center of his body, and that would have taken more time than if I'd asked you to start off so focusing on his head. The further you'd shifted your mental gaze, from where you started, his feet, middle of the body, or head, to the target, the ears, the longer it would have taken. So we've done experiments to demonstrate that more formally. Uh, here's one. This is an island with seven locations on it that are positioned such that the 21 inner point distances are all distinct. People learn to draw this map. They indicate the hut with that X, the well with that X, and so forth. They get very good at doing this. Later, they close their eyes. They hear the name of one of the locations, like hut, they're asked to mentally focus their gaze on that location, wait, their eyes are closed, and then they hear the name of another location, another object rather. It could be tree, it could be grass, or it could be bench, which is not on the map. Their job is to look for, quote unquote, the second location. If they find it, push one button. If they looked around and can't find it, push another button. Measure the response time. So we have them start off focusing on each object equally often, and they end up on each other ob object equally often, and then, of course, an equal number of cases where they didn't find it. Here's what these are response times, as you find, um, is a function of the distance between where they started initially and where they ended up. So what you see is the further they had to scan, the longer it's taking. This is just what you predict if, in fact, there's a, a depictive representation there, which there's some kind of mental space being used to represent actual space. So we're using response times as a kind of mental tape measure. The further they have to scan, the longer it takes, which presumably is evidence that there really was distance embodied in the image. We've done this without using any imagery instructions. So here's a task where they see an annulus, a square annulus, with three cells that are formed, filled in randomly. They study this, push a button, it goes off, and then an arrow appears for 50 milliseconds. The arrow can be anywhere in this interior region. Uh, three distances, this is far, it would be here, would be medium, that would be close. The task is simply, if it were present, the entire display the way you're seeing it now, would the arrow point to a filled square, as it does now, or an empty square? And it's a, it's a good imagery task. It's based on something that Steve Pinker and Ron Fink invented years before. It doesn't require any instructions to use imagery. What you find is the times, near, medium, and far, uh, increase with distance. Um, this is Harvard students, by the way. 
and these are Air Force pilots. ETL Drawer and I did this experiment years ago. Uh, he actually lived on an Air Force base for a summer to test the pilots. And what you see here is the slopes are identical. That is the time to scan. Uh, but the, the pilots are just generally faster. Just as an aside, mental rotation. So try this. Imagine the uppercase letter N. Can you do that? If you rotate it 90 degrees clockwise, is it another letter? What is it? OK, well, it turns out the further you have to rotate it, the longer it takes. Roger Shepard had demonstrated this years ago. Um, they're about 10 times faster at mental rotation than Harvard students, the pilots. So imagery is not just one thing. It breaks down into separate capacities. But for scanning, which reflects the underlying representation, the spatial characteristics, the, the slope was the same, which was interesting. Um, the problem is with these kind of behavioral experiments is you can always argue, as my debating partner, Zen and Plishin, argued, that there are um, task demands, that the mere fact that you are setting up the experiment in a way that requires scanning leads them to tap unconscious knowledge about perception. And they think to themselves all unconsciously, well, the further I would scan, the longer I would take, so I'll just regulate my times all unconsciously. It's very hard to disprove this kind of explanation. So one move that we made is we turned to the brain. We said, all right, let's go to a case where they don't know what's going on, so they can't regulate it, namely what's going on in their brain. So we turn to neuroimaging methods. We measure brain activation during performance. Um, so this is a, a standard old uh, 1.5T magnet. They go in there. Um, there is a, a gantry set up with a computer where they can see stimuli, and they're responding to um, particular task they're asked to do. So the question we asked here is, does visual mental imagery, which is where you're forming a visual representation based on information stored in memory, um, rely on neural mechanisms that specifically support depictive representations during visual perception? So we know that there are depictive representations during perception. The question is, are the areas that support them also activated during imagery? How do we know this? Largely from monkey models. Here's a macaque monkey brain. Here's the unfolded cortex. This area in particular I'm going to focus on, area V1, because we know a lot about it. In particular, look at this result from Roger Tutel et al. They had a monkey focus on the center of this pattern. The lights are flashing on and off. The monkey is injected with 2-deoxyglucose, a radioactively tagged sugar. The more neurons are working, the more of this sugar they take up. It's radioactive. It gets lodged in neurons. It doesn't get broken down very quickly. What you see here is area V1 also called Area 17, where neurons that took up a lot of the tracer are shown as dark. And you can literally see the right part of this pattern laid out on cortex, this is the left hemisphere. So the right visual field goes in the left part of the brain, left visual field goes in the right. Isn't this cool? So it's, it's not just that it's laid out on cortex. If you get a hole right here, which I, of course, don't recommend, but um, it, it will result in a blind spot in the corresponding part of the visual field. If you have two holes that are near each other, the blind spots will be near each other. So this is functionally representing the field. It's functionally depictive. It's not just anatomically laid out that way. It's actually representing using space on cortex to represent space in the world. Um, this is V1, which we're looking at. The eye would be down here. The only thing I wanted to point out is that there are no arrowheads on this diagram connecting the areas. Why? Because virtually every area that receives information and afferent from a lower level area, also sends information back to it. So the idea, and this is an old, old idea, it goes back to Bain, who was discussed in William James' Principles of Psychology, uh, 1890s. Um, the idea is that information is stored and replayed backwards to reconstruct the local geometry. So the anatomy is there. I don't have time to go through this in detail. In humans, this is a talc atlas slice. The eye would be here. This first visual area is medial. Um, so I, I tell my undergraduate students, this is a deep mohawk. It is sliced right down the middle. So it would be like this. So your, your eye is here. Uh, area V1 in humans. Area 17 is in the back of the brain. The way it's folded and the way it's laid out, the very central part of the field is very posterior. And as you get more periforeal, it, it, gets, it gets larger. The activation moves anterior. This is calcarin sulcus. Surrounding it is area 17. Surrounding that is area 18. Area 17 is V1 equivalent. Um, OK, so this was one of the first PET experiments done by Peter Fox et al. to essentially show that PET, positron emission tomography, a basic uh, human neuroimaging technique, was working. 
So they, they flashed red and black alternating checkerboards right in the fovea, or they spared the fovea but stimulated increasingly further or even further out still. So forget about this for the moment. So where would you expect this to activate? Right on the fovea. Where should it be along the calcarine cortex? Very posterior. And what should happen as it gets larger? How should the activation move for this versus that? Goes increasingly anterior. So that's what they found. This is 1986 or so. So this is resting. This is when you subtract the activation from resting. It's very posterior for the small. Medium, it moves up. Large, it moves up even further. This is directly photographed from the journal. That's the way it looked. So PET works. It was very heartening. Um, so we decided to do a comparable experiment with imagery. So we had, OK, try this. Close your eyes, please. Imagine the uppercase letter A. As small as you can make it and still be able to see it in your mental image clearly. Are there any curved lines, yes or no? Is there an enclosed space? OK. Are there any diagonal lines? All right, so there are a set of eight questions, um, one at a time. So they, they heard letters in one condition, that names of letters, their eyes are closed. They visualize it as small as possible. In another condition, they visualize the letters as large as they can make them without them seeming to overflow. So the logic was, when it's very small, we expect activation in a central region, because, there's a, um, because that's where the image is, and it should be more activation with the large image. Why? Because either there's nothing here for the large image, as you can see, or a single segment, whereas for the small image, there should be a lot of spatial variation that has to be maintained. So we expect more activation where for the small image? Compared to the large? Anterior or posterior? Okay, it should be very posterior for the small compared to the large, and vice versa for the large. So here's what you find. This is 16 subjects. This is pet images. This is the back of their head. This will be their nose. This will be the left hemisphere. This is the right. So it's as if they're laying down, you're looking at them from the chin up. And the reason left and right are reversed, because this came out of radiology, clinical radiology. So at bedside, you don't want a Stroop effect. You want the left side of what you see in the scan to correspond to the left side of what you see in the bed, namely the patient. So they reverse left and right, because you're seeing it from the bottom up. So forget all this for now. I don't have time to talk about it. But look at the very back of the brain, posterior area 17, much more activated by the small image than the large. Now we look at the other way around, large versus small. It moves forward. Here's another view of the same data. The eye would be here. So activated for the small versus large, very posterior. You can see it's moving right up along the calcarine for what's more activated by large than small. So this came out rather well. The trouble is that it's only two points, and people argue, well, maybe it's a difficulty effect, and maybe it's this, maybe it's that. So here's an experiment um, where we refined it slightly. Uh, we had people memorize line drawings in advance. Um, later in the scanner, their eyes are closed. They're asked a question like, uh, guitar, visualize that. Well, for that drawing, was the right side higher than the left, true or false? And the answer is false here. Uh, for the anchor, the right side is higher than the left. But for the guitar, the left side was higher for this drawing. So you all get the tasks. So to get them right, you have to visualize those particular drawings. The trick was we had four conditions, one where they just visualized it. Um, sorry, four conditions. One where they heard the stimuli, guitar, right side higher. Okay. And just responded by alternating. That's a baseline. And then we had three imagery conditions. Um, either in advance they saw a square in front of them that was a subtended as a quarter degree of visual angle, and they were asked to visualize all of those objects as if they were that size. Another, they saw a square that was four degrees of visual angle. Another was um, 16. And they were, so they were supposed to visualize the objects at the size corresponding to the square. So there were four conditions. We rotated the stimulus tapes so that each condition occurred equally often at each size, and we counterbalanced the order of these conditions. So what we're going to do is compare the identical auditory stimuli to three imagery conditions, where they're forming images very small, medium, or large. And here's what you find. Uh, it's almost all in the right hemisphere. For the smallest images, it's the circles back here. Medium size, it's that square. Large, it's actually a much bigger swath. It's a little bit in the left hemisphere, but not much of anything. So this worked out rather well.
But it's just correlational. When they're imaging, we're getting activation. How do we know that this is actually playing a causal role? You're not going to get that from neuroimaging. You have to use another technique. So last bit here, neurostimulation methods. We want to establish a causal relationship between the brain activity and performance. So the task was they memorized in advance. Uh, this was in collaboration with pa uh, Alvaro Pascalioni, by the way. They memorized in advance uh, sets of stripes. They didn't know it, but we can later ask them to make comparisons between the four quadrants. This is quadrant one, two, three, four. So when their eyes are closed, they're asked to visualize, say, one and four, and then decide whether the stripes in four were longer than the ones in one, or whether they were more rotated from the vertical, or whether they were separated more, whether they're thicker. So we had these dimensions. It's a good imagery task. This is what is activated during that task. This is seen from the back of the brain. It's like this right up the barrel of the calcarin. You can see it's nicely activated, a little 18 as well. So this is just to validate that we got imagery. They claim they were using imagery as well. Here was the trick. For this experiment, the crucial thing is we gave um, transcranial magnetic stimulation before the task. So first, so what, what that technique consists of is you have a coil. You put a current through it very briefly. It creates a big magnetic field. It's placed right on the skull. The magnetic field excites the neurons right under it. They, get, um, they start firing. You do this repeatedly. So this is a repetitive TMS. It's once a second. Yeah, it's slower than that, but I'm, I have five minutes, so I have to go faster. Um, the neurons get tired after a while. There's a technical term called discombobulation, uh, where they stop being so, so responsive. So first we do it over the motor cortex. This is really weird, by the way. You can actually, I've had this done, you can actually move it over your motor cortex and feel your individual fingers twitching. It's almost like magic typing, completely controlled by where it's being stimulated. Uh, we find a threshold where we get their fingers twitching, we move it back to the back of the brain, and we either push it, we position it so that it's, it's, it's going right up the calcium cortex, each person we had an MRI for, so we know where that was, or we push it further in the nape of the neck, so it's actually missing the whole area, it goes up at the back. I was a subject, my data's not here, I actually, if I had to guess which condition was which, I got it backwards. Um, so, before the task, the same task, okay, we stimulate either right up the calcium cortex where we get it fatigued, or we miss it. And then we have them doing this task perceptually where they actually see the things. This is a way just to make sure we stimulate it enough because if we're not getting disruption of this task perceptually, then we're not gonna find it in imagery. Or they do it with their eyes closed and do it in imagery. Here are the results from individual subjects. This is in perception where they're actually looking at it. This is sham when it's missing V1, and this is real, sham V1. So every subject showed longer response times following what they call real stimulation, that is aimed at V1 versus missing it in perception. So if this didn't work, we would have just stopped because we know V1 is involved in perception. This is the more interesting set of results where it's imagery, their eyes are closed, sham, this is for one person versus real, other people. If you average over these, the effect size is almost identical. It's statistically identical. So this is good evidence that, in fact, V1 is playing a role in imagery. Finally, meta-analysis. There have been 59 studies of imagery using MRI, PET, or SPECT. Um, most of them show this effect, but not all of them. So we tried to figure out why not. And there were 21 variables that distinguished the different studies. We did regression analyses. It turns out you can explain virtually all of the variation by three things, whether the task requires high-resolution details. If you don't need to see high-resolution de details in your imagery, like what shape an animal's ears are, you don't get it. Um, if it's spatial, you get activation of parietal lobe, not in V1. So non-spatial images will, is correlated. And finally, the stronger, the more sensitive the technique, the more likely you are to find it. And these are all highly significant. The residual is, does nothing. So currently in my lab, we're testing each of these individually instead of just using post-hoc analyses. So finally, remember those questions I started out with? I've spent a huge amount of time looking at this question of whether there's something picture-like, whether space is being used to represent space, internal space is being used to represent space. But along the way, we've learned a lot. These were trick questions. Um, first is a shape question, second is a color question, third is a spatial question. Although it's not evident in respection, shape, spatial, and color imagery rely on distinct neural systems. So you find shape processing, 
is activating areas that we know to be specifically involved in the shape. I already mentioned the spatial processing is posterior parietal lobe, and color processing is yet another area. So in addition to starting to crack open this nut that's been around for a couple thousand years about whether there are mental pictures, Plato has a section on this, um, talks about memory in terms of the a wax tablet where there's impurities in the wax and how hard it is and so forth, and you carve pictures into it. And it, we're actually getting some traction by using these new techniques to get at the question of whether images depict information or whether the aspects that seem pictorial to introspection are just epiphenomena or not. And the data seem to be, at this point, indicating that, yes, under some circumstances, for some kinds of tasks, we truly do have depicted images. And we couldn't have made this kind of progress sticking purely with behavioral methods. There were simply too many ways to explain the data. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks to everybody for coming to this interesting symposium. And uh, I think that my remarks will really build on uh, Professor Coslin's remarks and uh, show how some of the same kinds of processes, uh, uh, interactions between brain and mind, have been operating in a different but related domain, namely that of memory. And uh, one basic point I just want to note uh, before uh, launching into uh, talking about ways in which the brain and mind sciences have interacted is that we have to keep in mind that, of course, the study of brain and mind can occur at, at many different levels of analysis. And uh, today, when I'm talking about brain and mind, I'm really talking uh, about how we link uh, our knowledge of brain regions or, or large-scale systems with cognitive processes. And it's an open question raised at the end of how much further down we can go to more refined levels, molecular, cellular, and, uh, and whatnot. Now, the way I'd like to organize uh, the talk is to give you some examples, uh, kind of like what you heard in the previous talk, uh, of specific, what I see as somewhat specific kinds of interactions between brain and mind that have taken place over the last 25, 30 years in the study of memory. And I'm going to talk about three different ways in which I think that the uh, brain science of memory has informed the mind science of memory, at least through my particular uh, lens. One, uh, I'll talk about uh, instances in which converging evidence and constraints on cognitive theorizing have been provided by evidence from the brain. Uh, I think that's what we just heard a nice example of uh, in the domain of mental imagery. Second, I'm going to talk about a, a, related, uh, a related way in which brain sciences have informed uh, mind sciences, namely that they, they can be a driver of hypothesis testing and suggest hypotheses that are relevant to cognitive sciences that we might not otherwise have uh, come across. And then finally, I want to talk about the idea of conceptual leveraging, that is, taking uh, seeing connections across different domains where observations from the brain, I think, can help us see relationships that we might not otherwise be attuned to. So my examples will be to illustrate three, three points. The first two examples I'm going to use kind of a tried and true phenomenon uh, that I've been involved with studying for almost as long as Coslin's been doing imagery, not quite that long. <laughs> that would be a really long time. But this goes, this goes back to the dark days of the early 1980s, um, before neuroimaging, before the internet. We still actually could do research. <laughs> and it was in that time, in the late 70s and the early 80s, that psychologists started uh, focusing in on what turned out to be a very interesting phenomenon. And this will be the the thing I'll talk about for the first two examples, uh, the phenomenon that in the memory field has come to be known as priming, uh, which I'll define as a non-conscious or implicit form of memory in which an encounter with a stimulus influences the subsequent identification, production, or classification of that stimulus or some related stimulus. And this is something that is familiar to many people. 
Uh, but for those who are not familiar with it, I should note that this is not necessarily subliminal perception or anything like that. The initial perception of the priming stimulus can be conscious or non-conscious. And subsequent uh, processing is non-conscious in the sense that the retrieval of the prior encounter is either involuntary, uh, not associated with conscious recollection of a prior experience, or both. So when we talk about priming being non-conscious, that's generally what we mean. Now I'm going to give my, uh, my version of the, Snoop, how many, uh, uh, the imagery Snoopy's ears demonstration, because it's one that goes back to my earliest uh, involvement with this phenomenon, back to uh, days when I was at the University of Toronto working with Endel Tolving. And we did a, a very simple experiment that, at the time in the early 80s, had some interesting, res uh, surprising to us results. We gave people a, a list of words. They were low-frequency words uh, of a kind you might use in any standard memory experiment. People studied these words for a few seconds each. Uh, and then we brought them back to the laboratory either an hour later or a week later. And people were given two kinds of tests. One was kind of a standard memory test. I show you the word assassin, and I say, think back to an hour earlier or a week early, do you remember having seen that word say yes if you do, no if you don't? St standard, what we would now call explicit or direct memory test. The other test was kind of the interesting one for the purpose of this experiment. There we gave people these incomplete fragments of words and we just said do your best to try to identify a word that fits with that fragment. And I know that people who have seen this before could probably do it, but others may not see what is there's one completion for that. Nobody? It's beeswax. Um, you'll probably have a lot easier time with this one. Cupcake. The difference between your difficulty in coming up with the completion for beeswax and cupcake, that's the phenomenon of priming. I showed you cupcake, cupcake a few seconds ago, kind of just jumps out at you automatically. Now, what was interesting from this very early uh, experiment, way back, published way back in 1982, was that a priming on the fragment completion test seemed to behave differently than recognition. Recognition did what Ebbinghaus 130 years ago said it would do, it went down over time. You recognize fewer items a week later than an hour later, no surprise. The priming effect, however, did not change over that one week delay. So that's priming because just guessing at those fragments would get you to about 20 or 30 percent correct without being previously primed and then having seen them takes you up to around 45%. So the difference between baseline completion, studied completion, is priming. Now these effects turn out to be incredibly long lasting. We thought one week was pretty neat for priming not to change. David Mitchell did, did us a lot better in a study he published in, 19, in 2006 where he followed subjects who had been undergraduates in a study that he connect, uh, uh, conducted back in the early 80s where he showed them pictures and then showed incomplete fragments of the picture that you'd have to identify. And when he tracked them down when they were then 39, 17 years later, <laughs> and sure enough, there's still a priming effect there. So one week was pretty good, 17 years. And these, most of these people had no idea they'd ever been in a memory experiment, and yet they still identified more of the studied pictures from the fragments than the non-studied. Well, at the time, there was a lot of discussion, and this is summarizing a lot of findings from the 80s and into the early 90s, that showed cognitive differences between priming and recognition in addition to um, the retention interval effect. Um, encoding manipulation had an effect on recall and recognition, had no effect on priming. Priming was sensitive to the changes uh, sometimes uh, in the physical features of target items. You show a word in uppercase, test it in lowercase, the priming effect could be reduced. Well, what do we make of all this? Well, there was a debate in the literature at the time between what came to be known as the memory systems and processing views. The processing view was kind of made the point that, you know, what you get out of memory depends a lot on how you test it. Recall can give you a different picture, picture from recognition. So too with priming. That gives you a little bit of a different picture, but you're really tapping into the same memory system in different ways with different measures that tell you different things. The memory systems view um, took a bit of a stronger line and said, no, priming is actually tapping into a, dis a distinct memory system. It's not just another way of testing memory. But we couldn't really settle that debate on the basis of purely cognitive evidence. So a key phenomenon in this early phase of research was that the phenomenon of priming we've been talking about was typically preserved in amnesic patients who had lesion to the medial temporal lobe and hippocampus who are disastrous on recall and recognition tests.
Uh, yet these individuals, if you put them in a priming experiment, would often uh, perform uh, normally despite the damage to this kind of a key center of the memory system that allows us to remember and re-experience episodes and the like. So here's an early example, I think, of evidence, in this case from neuropsychology, not neuroimaging, putting a, a constraint on cognitive theorizing because it became very difficult to hold the view that it's just different ways of testing memory um, when you could show that, in fact, uh, a, a, a critical a structure that was critical for performing a whole class of tasks in explicit recall and recognition was not necessary uh, for performing uh, the priming tasks. And so Tulving and I, Larry Squire and others, went on to uh, use other data provided by observations from the brain to argue uh, for the characteristics of a particular system that we thought was involved in priming. So there's one example from neuropsychological evidence of a constraint on cognitive theorizing imposed by looking at data from the brain. Okay, number two, driver of hypothesis testing. I want to illustrate what I mean by this, that observations of the brain can drive us to test hypotheses that have cognitive relevance uh, by moving up to the neuroimaging era. Now, one of the interesting things we've learned from, mainly from imaging studies in the 90s carried out uh, using variants of priming paradigms, and this is one that uh, from a, a collaborative study that Randy Buckner led that we did a number of years ago, where you'd get exposures to pictures of objects, uh, and then some of those objects on a test would be repeated. You'd make judgments about uh, these items, and you'd look at reaction time and brain activity in the fMRI scanner uh, for uh, previously studied items and for novel items that had not appeared earlier. And one surprising finding that turned up and was consistently found in a number of studies, this is one of, of several of them, is that there were reliable reductions in brain activity associated with priming. That is, there were a number of regions that showed less activity for primed items than for non-primed items. Here, the re priming-related uh, activity reduction is occurring in posterior visual regions and up also uh, in, the, in the frontal lobes. Now, a lot was made of this, and one of the interesting ideas to come out of this novel observation uh, uh, that neuroimaging of the brain contributed to priming uh, was what has been called the neural tuning view of priming. And this is put forward nicely by Alec, uh, Alex Martin and Sherry Wiggs in a paper about 10 years ago. And their idea was that you could think about these decreases in terms of kind of a tuning of a perceptual representation of an object. So on successive exposures with priming, the representation is kind of tuned or sharpened up and only the essential features uh, uh, are of the object now are used, at least for purposes of the task, for primed items. So this is kind of a different way of thinking about priming than uh, um, many of us uh, had entertained, and it led Ian Dobbins, David Schneer, Mika Verfai, and I uh, to have a conversation uh, in which we thought of what would be a very simple test of this tuning view. Uh, and that had to do with the question of whether the priming-related reduction um, had anything to do with the response that you made to the item? Is priming response or decision specific? Because if what's happening here in priming is these perceptual representations are getting tuned by experience, it really shouldn't matter how you respond to the item, what response you make uh, on, on a study uh, and test trial. So we conducted a study. We don't have to go into all the details um, given the time. But the important thing here is that subjects were initially, they're in the scanner, they're shown objects. and in this first phase of the experiment, we had them answer a particular question. Is this object bigger than a shoebox, yes or no? And for some items, the answer is yes. For others, uh, the answer is no. So there's some novel items. Low primed items appear uh, uh, twice in the study phase. High primed items appear three times. Now, here's the critical manipulation to pay attention to. It's very simple, but it hadn't been done before in imaging studies and, and really not in cognitive studies either. Um, we switched the response that subjects made. So now you are asked, is the item smaller than a shoebox? And the logic here is very simple. If all that's going on here is there's perceptual tuning, let's say in visual cortex, of uh, object representations, then it really shouldn't matter whether you, uh, what decision or response that you make uh, to the item. And then there's a final phase where you restore the initial decision. Um, now, uh, the interesting finding here was that both behavioral and neural priming indeed showed some response specificity. That is, the 
reductions in uh, prefrontal uh, regions and fusiform, uh, posterior fusiform regions that I showed you earlier that accompany priming went away when you switched the response. So that provided strong evidence, we think, that the, response, uh, that the tuning model could not account for the entire uh, phenomenon. In fact, it turned out that the frontal lobe was playing uh, uh, an important role um, in this priming phenomenon. So here's a case basically where observations from the brain, neural decreases led to a new idea of tuning and that led us to a question that we wouldn't have asked otherwise on the basis of purely uh, behavioral data. And then in turn has led uh, Guggen Wig and Dell Stevens in my lab and I to propose a, a multi-component model of, of priming that kind of takes account of some of these higher order um, uh, uh, effects uh, up in the frontal lobe that seem to be most closely related to the response or decision switching phenomenon that we observed in the uh, uh, previous study. Okay, and then last point, I've only got a few minutes, is what I'm going to call conceptual leveraging where we are able, I would suggest, to see connections sometimes across different domains uh, by looking at, at brain data. And here I'm just going to give you a, a cartoon illustration of a different line of work. This is something we've been involved in uh, recently where we've been doing brain imaging studies asking uh, questions about the relationship between what goes on in your brain when you remember a past event that actually happened to you versus when you imagine a future event that might happen to you plausibly within the next few days, weeks, or months. Um, this is a cartoon of, of the paradigm taken from a review article Donna Addis, uh, Randy Buckner, and I wrote uh, last year in Nature Reviews. And this is a cartoon of a paradigm that, uh, that uh, has been led by Donna Addis and some, uh, a variety of studies in our lab. People are in the scanner, they're given a cue, it could be a simple word cue, and they are asked to remember an actual experience that uh, happened to them or imagine something that might happen to them. It's more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's the essence of it. And the interesting finding from that study and a, number, a growing number of other studies is that there's a set of regions that we've come to refer to as a core network uh, that shows very comparable activity when you're remembering the past and imagining the future. Um, now, we didn't really have a, uh, uh, a strong reason as a field to believe that these two activities were so closely linked until we saw some of these brain maps showing very striking overlaps. And indeed, the overlaps in this, uh, these core network regions, including the uh, uh, medial temporal lobe and hippocampus, uh, lateral uh, parietal and temporal cortices, areas up in the frontal lobes, and uh, precuneus, uh, precuneus retrosplenial, it turns out that this is even somewhat more general, as pointed out in a nice paper by Buckner and Carroll last year, and shown formally in a, in a, in a uh, forthcoming uh, meta-analysis from Nathan Spring, uh, who was at Toronto when he did this, now a postdoc in, in our lab. And basically what they showed in their meta-analysis is that this overlap I just showed you when people remember the past and imagine the future, called here prospection, also shows up to a large extent in tasks involving spatial na navigation theory of, the mind and, of mind and when people are in default mode, kind of just sitting there in the scanner not doing much of everything. So here's a case where the, the similar brain activity across these different domains now leads us to ask cognitively interesting questions about well, why is this happening, what are the shared cognitive components, how can we understand this overlap at a cognitive level, and I don't think we would have gotten there uh, as easily without these uh, brain observations. So we've uh, considered now three different ways in which uh, brain sciences of memory, I would suggest that inform uh, the mind sciences, and looking to the future, there are many questions, I'm sure we'll get into them in discussion, uh, as I noted at the beginning, the work focused on here, bridges from the level of brain systems to cognitive questions. Uh, cognitive systems, it, systems, it's an open question as to how much further down in the food chains, so to speak, from the cognitive perspective we can go. Uh, can we have this kind of useful dialogue at cellular, molecular uh, levels? That's a question for the future. Thanks.
great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you, Mark, for inviting us. Um, I'm going to talk about language, and I'm going to have a slightly different take from my colleagues. I'm going to be a little, a little bit less optimistic about what it is that we've learned about the mind from the, from the brain. Um, also, as a challenge, perhaps, to get the discussion going. Now, uh, until recently, almost everything we knew about uh, language and the brain came to us from the study of uh, uh, language pathology, from the study of patients with brain damage, and, um, and uh, uh, the correlation between particular kinds of deficits one observed in patients with the area of damage in the brain. And we've learned a lot. We've learned we have a pretty good idea of which, uh, uh, which areas of the brain uh, are involved in which uh, very uh, uh, major components of language processing. And uh, the way in which this, this happens, or the way this works, is the following. I'll just give a few examples to give you a feel for the exciting kinds of data that one can collect. Um, this is a, a, an example of a, a task where a patient is asked to describe this picture, and what you can see uh, right away, you don't have to be a linguist uh, to see this, uh, that the patient uh, is able to articulate perfectly uh, some of the words uh, and not others. And uh, furthermore, that uh, if you just imagined what those uh, neologisms might be, uh, you could probably think that the patient was trying to say the horse was jumping over the fence. Uh, but somehow, uh, the articulators just couldn't get the right information to produce the nouns and the verbs. So at the very least, something like this is telling us that the ways in which our knowledge of words is organized must be such as to make a major distinction between words like nouns and verbs on the one hand and words like articles, prepositions, and so on. Another example uh, along these lines uh, is uh, this uh, picture where a patient is asked to describe uh, what, uh, uh, what is in the picture, and the patient says um, uh, the box has been negated by the misused staff. Now, this is a truly beautiful sentence. Too bad Chomsky didn't have it when he wrote his book because he could have used it, and then it would have been a real a sentence produced by a real person, although Chomsky, I guess, produced his own colors in a uh, 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 sleep furiously sentence. So again, you can see here uh, a fairly remarkable uh, demonstration of ideas that, uh, that are found in, uh, in, uh, in the linguistic literature, in this case, uh, the work of people like Chomsky and many others, uh, that we should distinguish, we have to distinguish between at least two counts, kinds of processes. Uh, those that are involved in organizing words in a sequence to produce well-formed sentences and the meaning that one is trying to communicate in a sentence. Now, of course, if we could identify the brain mechanisms that are involved in these dissociations, we might have then a pretty good idea of uh, um, how uh, uh, the brain uh, represents language. Now, these are very gross dissociations, so I'll just illustrate very rapidly a much, much finer dis uh, dissociation. Uh, this is uh, uh, two patients, uh, one of whom has great difficulties uh, in producing uh, consonants, but not vowels. Another one has great difficulties in producing vowels, but not consonants. Uh, this is a fairly remarkable dissociation. You can see it here in a, uh, when this happens to be an Italian patient. Uh, uh, when asked to write, uh, uh, to, to, to speak a word like muratore, the patient made, in this case, consonants, uh, errors in the consonants uh, part of the word, a few errors, uh, uh, many more, uh, made, made no errors on the consonant part, made many errors on the vowel part, uh, and uh, the other patient I'm, I showed you uh, shows the opposite pattern of, of difficulties. Again, um, brain damage seems to dissociate, seems to carve uh, mind into, at this, as Stephen Carlson once put it, at its joints, uh, showing us the uh, components of processing uh, that are used, uh, in this case, in producing language. Um, uh, I'm going to focus, though, for the rest of, of this time on, on, on another phenomenon, uh, because it's one where I've worked and I've tried to use the various methods that we heard uh, today, uh, so it's easier to see how, uh, how the various methods converge in an attempt to try and articulate a theory of both language and the brain. Uh, this is uh, um, a 
a picture that is used in many clinical tests of aphasia, patients with language impairments. Uh, and this is what one patient said in response to this picture. Uh, oh, Lordy, she's making a mess. She let the thing go, and it's getting on the floor. They're stealing something. He's falling. He's going to hurt himself. She's cleaning these things. She's looking at him falling, and she's going to get some of the stuff he's giving her. Now, it's perfectly normal speech. If you're looking at the picture, you have no trouble understanding uh, what she's saying. It's, it's just perfectly uh, comprehensible. But note what is happening. She's not able to produce nouns. The nouns are not there. She's producing pronouns or words like stuff or, or thing uh, because she cannot retrieve nouns. Uh, another patient uh, with a different type of impairment, this patient says, okay, the boy is, his cookies, he is, his sister is, look for him, cookies, but he's going to fall out of his stool and so on and so on. As you can see, uh, here the patient does not have trouble producing words like cookies and, and sister and, and the like, uh, stool and whatever. The patient's difficulties seem to be in producing the verbs. And when you can't produce the verb, as a consequence, you, have a, you also have difficulty in, uh, in having a well-formed sentence. Whereas in the case of, of the nouns, you can just put your pronouns there with no, no difficulty and the sentences come out perfectly well-formed. Uh, so, uh, so the question is, is this evidence for a distinction between nouns and verbs? Is this, is this a, a demonstration that the brain honors the noun-verb distinction as a grammatical distinction? Um, uh, what can we learn from uh, this kind of dissociation? Unfortunately, uh, uh, it, it turns out that um, one might want to explain these data not by appealing to linguistic constructs like noun and verb, but by appealing to more cognitive, more conceptual uh, notions like object and action. And one of the unfortunate, um, for us uh, uh, cognitive scientists, uh, uh, consequences of the ways in which language, languages are structured is that nouns uh, and verbs uh, as grammatical objects correlate highly uh, with other properties. Uh, so nouns prototypically are objects, verbs prototypically are actions. Um, uh, nouns tend to be more concrete, uh, uh, verbs more abstract. Nouns are rich sensorially. Uh, verbs have important functional characteristics. Uh, and as a consequence, um, we don't know why our patients have difficulties in producing nouns and verbs, one, one might say. Perhaps they have difficulties with nouns, not because they have a, a lesion or damage to a grammatical processing device, uh, but because they have difficulties with these kinds of, of, of properties. Well, um, neuropsychologists, um, um, uh, just like every other, other kind of, 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 guess, of scientist, uh, or, or imaginative and creative, and in this case, sometimes nature helps. Uh, brain damage uh, really represents an experiment of nature. Uh, and if nature does the right experiment, then we can get the right result. Uh, in this case, the experiment she performed is one of producing a lesion that affected a patient's difficulty in writing a verb, but not in speaking a verb. So we have a modality-specific impairment, a difficulty restricted to just, in this case, writing a word, but not in speaking it. Because the difficulty is restricted to only one modality, to one form, the impairment cannot be a conceptual semantic impairment. The patient knows what climbing is, simply cannot find the mechanism for producing it in written form. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is to just to quantify it. Uh, I, I don't know why I'm showing the data because the phenomenon is, is quite striking. Uh, two patients, HW and SJD, one patient has great difficulties in speaking verbs but not in writing them. The other patient has great difficulties in writing verbs but not in speaking them. And note that both patients and either patient has difficulties uh, in producing the noun form of those words when they're homonyms. So if you have to write, the, if, produce the word play, either as a noun or a verb, the patient has no difficulties when used as a noun. The difficulties only emerge when it's produced as a verb and then only within one modality of output. Um, um, just one final demonstration of this is quite uh, to show you that these are real striking effects. This is a patient with a primary progressive aphasia, a patient whose performance is declining over time. Uh, the patient uh, was able to, uh, in this case, write nouns over a period of two years without any decrement in performance. Uh, then uh, she, had, uh, she had no decrement in performance when, uh, when uh, writing the verbs, no decrement in performance when orally producing nouns, when she had to produce 
verbs uh, uh, orally, that is when she had to speak a verb, all of a sudden she was severely impaired and this impairment uh, uh, increased over time to the point where at the end she was totally incapable of producing any now, any verbs and only could utter nouns, whereas she's able to produce some verbs uh, a few years earlier. Um, so some conclusions from data such as these. Um, uh, well, I mean, uh, these data can be used, I think, by those of us who are interested in constructing a theory of our language works uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, in the following way. So, for example, we can be certain from certain. We can argue, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm fairly certain, but some, some people will disagree. Uh, we can be, uh, some of us might be convinced that data such as these, uh, I think, show that the phonological and orthographic uh, forms of words must be represented in the brain independently, and they uh, function uh, independently in some theory of language processing. Furthermore, this confirm a very uh, popular theory of how we write. Uh, uh, most theories of writing assume that we first retrieve the phonological form of the word and then we produce the written form. Well, if that were the case, the dissociations I've described would not happen. So those things would, uh, would, have, to, would have to modify the theory. However, even with this beautiful data, um, and this is, I, I was convinced by this data many years ago, we still cannot argue that these data show that grammatical category, qua grammatical category, is represented in the brain independently uh, or, um, of other properties uh, of words. And the reason uh, is that one can imagine that, uh, imagine the following theory. You, you represent uh, your knowledge of concepts, action concepts in one part of the brain, um, uh, object concepts in other parts of the brain. You then have your lexical forms over here, the written forms, the spoken forms. Imagine disconnecting one of these semantic uh, domains. Well, if that were the case, then you would get just a pattern of performance that I described. And so that would not, it's not sufficient. Um, we have then turned uh, to a different uh, um, uh, uh, strategy to try and converge uh, on this uh, um, on this question, and we 've studied patient 's processing of words as grammatical objects uh, and so uh, very quickly, I will report three patients to show you uh, the kinds of dissociations you can get uh, patients r c and patient h g uh, both have difficulties in naming verbs uh, uh, relative to nouns, and patient j r has difficulties in naming nouns relative to verbs and what we did was we asked them to perform a task. Uh, that did not involve uh, generating uh, a word anew, but simply uh, uh, produce a transformation of a word we gave them, uh, a, phonolog a morphological alternation task. The patient is given a word, a, a sentence like, this is a sale. Uh, these are all homonyms. Uh, these are, the patient was required to complete this sentence fragment by saying sales. Uh, he sales, they sail. So uh, either produce the word as a noun uh, or a verb, uh, and uh, uh, what you find in this particular case, a patient has difficulties with verbs uh, relative to nouns. And this difficulty is found, uh, in, interestingly, also when you ask the patients to produce uh, uh, neologisms uh, or pseudo-words like wags, uh, words that don't exist in the person's dictionary. This is a task that was developed in, in the late 50s here at Harvard by Jean Berko Gleason working with Roger Brown. Um, and, um, uh, so the task is identical to the, uh, to the real word task, except that these uh, sounds uh, are not part of the lexicon, our, our lexicon. And you can see the patient shows difficulties uh, in processing the verb form as opposed to the noun form. Um, can we conclude, uh, uh, one possibility I have is that nouns uh, are not as hard to produce as verbs, um, and so you need to have what is called in, in our literature a double dissociation. You need to show that you get the opposite pattern of impairment. And indeed, uh, patient JR, uh, uh, patient JR uh, has greater difficulties in producing nouns than verbs, and has greater difficulties in producing the morphology of nouns uh, versus the verbs. Um, uh, all uh, these difficulties that we've described uh, uh, trivial consequences of damage to the semantic system. Once again, if you damage the semantic system and there's a trickle down of difficulties to later processing stages, perhaps this will affect uh, the processing. Uh, so what you need to show is that you can have damage uh, that is restricted uh, damage to the processing of, of, of verbs uh, relative to nouns, say in a naming task, uh, but spared morphological processing 
uh, capabilities. And indeed, uh, there are such patients uh, showing that the morphological task uh, does not depend on an intact semantic system. In other words, our knowledge, as shown to you by the, the first two slides that I showed you uh, at the very beginning of this talk, uh, where the syntax and the semantics of language seem to be truly dissociable. Um, okay, so uh, what can we conclude from this? Um, well, I think that uh, one conclusion is that different brain circuits uh, are involved in representing grammatical knowledge about nouns and verbs, uh, and these are dissociable from circuits involved in retrieving word form and meaning. However, uh, these data and these cases uh, don't help us very much if we're interested in the brain. And one reason is that those of you who, who see patients know that to have persistent uh, difficulties, difficulties that continue in time, lesions have to be very large. Uh, and if you have large lesions, like these two patients that I've just described to you, it's very difficult to know which particular areas are important for the things I've told you about. And that's where the techniques and methodologies that Stephen, uh, Professor Carlson, and Professor Schachter talked about uh, come in handy, because now we can uh, um, study uh, intact brains uh, using the tasks I've just been using with patients and ask the question, uh, can we now identify which brain regions are involved uh, in the processing that I've described uh, happens when you look at patients? And what we've done using uh, the MRI um, uh, techniques that, that, uh, that have just been described, we found that, that uh, for the morphosyntactic task, the task that involves changing uh, play into place, um, that uh, some areas are important for verbs, the, the blue, and one area in this particular case is important for nouns. And so one could say, well, here we have identified finally uh, the two neural circuits that represent the grammatical categories nouns and verbs. Um, and that would have been wonderful if, if, if I could have uh, concluded that. Um, fMRI shows distinct brain regions are active when subjects produce nouns and verbs. Um, but it's not clear what is supported by those areas. Uh, and a priori, it's unlikely that these areas are in involved in syntax uh, and, uh, in these cases. And the reason it's unlikely is because when you damage those parts of the brain, we know uh, you don't get the grammatical depths I've been describing. So clearly, what MRI is telling us is very important, but exactly what it's telling us is not clear. And, uh, and well, that, I want to get this discussion going uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, so, so we use a technique, we, we follow uh, Professor uh, Cousin's example, and we use uh, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. That is, we try and interfere with the process by stimulating uh, the areas. And in this particular case, we, we stimulated an area in the anterior midfrontal gyrus or in the posterior midfrontal gyrus, I will show you in a moment, uh, to see whether uh, if we uh, uh, interfere with those two areas, we produce the difficulties that I've described uh, or found in patients. And uh, what we found is uh, something quite, uh, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, this is the right hemisphere, this is the left. Uh, I'm not a radiologist, so I get confused if I don't put them right, right, and left, left. Um, this is the right hemisphere, the left hemisphere. This is the anterior midfrontal gyrus, the posterior midfrontal gyrus, another area that is important for language, the Broca's area. Uh, and what this shows is uh, what Carson was showing you before, uh, performance in, a, uh, in comparing sham, when this is when you, when you uh, use the stimulator uh, on the head without actually directing the magnetic field that into the head. And what you see is that the only area that shows an interference in processing verbs is area number one in the left hemisphere, an anterior midfrontal gyrus area. And, uh, and the area number three, which is the area that shows up in our imaging studies, uh, shows absolutely no, no effect when you stimulate it uh, in this morphosyntactic task. Okay, um, now I'm, I conclude here with just a, a, a few slides. Um, um, the results are such as these and, 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 and many others, not only the ones from, 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 uh, from, from my lab, but uh, clearly from, from many other laboratories, um, I think converge on, on what I think is perhaps the beginning of a plausible story of how language is represented in the brain, at least at the level of lexical processing. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a, a fairly complex circuit uh, 
uh, that represents uh, um, uh, the core conceptual properties of, of, of the meaning of words. And this is distributed over very large areas involving the frontal areas, the parietal, the temporal uh, parts of the brain. And this is the part that is, has more to do with the meanings of words. Uh, there's another area, uh, or the other areas that perhaps are involved in processing the morphosyntactic properties of words. There's the things that turn uh, sounds into grammatically uh, defined uh, objects. So uh, when play becomes a verb, it becomes a verb because it undergoes some type of processing where this area uh, plays an important role. Either this area the tissue here or this tissue in connection with other areas we don't know, um, but, but certainly from my experiments, these two areas seem to be important in processing the more syntactic characteristics of nouns. Uh, and then a more uh, uh, inferior, uh, uh, posterior part of the frontal lobe uh, seems to be important in processing the morpho morphophonological properties of words. It is the actual production of the, uh, say, the form played. Um, the, uh, that realization happens to be uh, in this part of the, of the brain. Okay. So, my, my, my final comment. Uh, how, and this is, the, I think, the title of, of, the, of the, this conversation, how have advances in brain science informed the mind sciences? And uh, um, I think that it's, 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 it's clear that neuropsychological observations, such as the ones I described, uh, have played uh, a central role in, in understanding the mind. Uh, uh, Schachter uh, um, mentioned this briefly. Carlson did not mention it, but some of the important research on imagery has come from study of brain damaged subjects. Um, there are patients with so-called neglect a disorder where a patient um, uh, is looking out in the world and, uh, and uh, is uh, unaware of a part of the, of the, of the, of the uh, visual field out there, um, uh, unaware uh, of, that, uh, of that information well, nonetheless being affected by it implicitly in the way in which Schechter uh, mentioned. Um, uh, so there are many, many disorders that have informed how th our theories of cognitive processing. And I think we are making progress in understanding how the brain makes uh, the mind possible. This, we are beginning to uh, construct theories along the lines, uh, um, uh, 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 theories that, that, that are not only interested in, in, in constructing a theory of, of, of the mind, but ask uh, the question, how does the brain make this theory of the mind possible? Uh, uh, and I think that the cognitive, uh, 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 in the cognitive neurosciences is slowly taking hold. I think that increasingly we are finding, when one reads papers in cognitive neuroscience, that the co cognitive theory is becoming more sophisticated. Um, and, and, uh, but clearly the discipline is in its infancy, uh, as has been pointed out. This was only uh, 15 years ago that we started using these methods, uh, and we're still struggling to understand what we're measuring. Uh, never mind being able to test theories uh, of the fine level of detail that we would like to, to be able to say that you're making advances in a theory of mind. So, um, so um, I'm very optimistic, uh, but I'm not sure that at this stage we have really made great progress in understanding the mind through the study of the brain, other than through the behavioral dissociations we observe. And those are behavioral observations, they're not brain observations. Even though they may be mapped onto the brain, the underlying information that is playing a role in the theory construction is a behavioral one. And it is that element, I think, that has played the most important part to date. Uh, and my hope is in the next 15, 20 years, uh, we're going to see uh, really a, um, a true introduction of cognition in the brain um, uh, sciences. Uh, and then I think we'll see, perhaps in 15 years, we can have another discussion whether we have really made progress in understanding the mind. Thank you. So, as I said at the beginning, for those you may have come in late, we're going to um, spend probably the next uh, 30 or so minutes um, of a conversation here, and then we'll open it up for some of the questions you might have. So, let me um, just start out with a, a just general comment, um, and I'd like to uh, and hear some responses. Um, I think often from the from the outside, the the media um, grasps onto a lot of the very flashy work in the cognitive neuroscience that often leans in the social direction. Things like neuroeconomics, um, using imaging to look at um, various aspects of 
consciousness and social relationships and things that are very, very kind of complicated and abstract. What, what was, to me, exciting about hearing the three of you talk um, is that, in some sense, the brain sciences work um, is going after things that have been fairly well articulated at the level of behavioral work and cognitive science work. And I think one of the reasons why I, I try to put you in the order I did is because, in some level, loosely, um, maybe Alfonso's pessimism reflects, in some sense, the, the sheer complexity of language as a phenomena to look at in terms of the brain sciences, as opposed to, let's say, imagery and memory. Um, so when we ask questions about what is the brain basis of language, one first has to have a real description of what we're looking for, and maybe that sheer complexity is what makes it so difficult. Whereas maybe when we're asking something about imagery, simply what we're looking for is some level easier. And then it gets ramified when we talk about economic decision making and our views about coalitionary behavior and so forth. So I guess one question is, is the kind of, um, let's say, more moderate pessimism that Alfonso expressed, and maybe that the two of you didn't express, simply a reflection of the difficulty of the problem that each of you is going after? So maybe, let me, let's ask that to Steve first, and maybe Dan and Alfonso. Well, yeah. I'm trying to avoid the recency effect. No, no, I mean, it's, I didn't see myself as being pessimistic. I, I said I was uh, optimistic. I thought we were going to make great progress. Uh, the, question was, uh, the question was whether we have today um, uh, modified our theories. I mean, I think the one, the one example was Stevens' example. Steven says, look, um, Carlin, Professor Carlin here, says, uh, Dean Carlin. <laughs> uh, he, he may cut my pay. <laughs> I should be careful. <laughs> uh, um, uh, I mean, I mean the, the, the example that, that uh, the one example we heard where I thought there was an attempt to say here is uh, one result that has actually affected our theorizing. Okay, so there are these two competing theories, and what I've shown you, Carson says, is that um, um, my theory makes predictions about the brain uh, that this other theory comes nowhere close to being able to even imagine, uh, and, and, and if, if nothing else, we should, we should uh, opt for this theory, since it has a range of explanation that is much, much larger than the one uh, proposed by Pelishin. And, and that's, that's positive. I think that's a, that exactly what I think is, will be ex is exciting about the discipline. And I think uh, uh, Schechter gave an example along those lines, how uh, certain uh, advances uh, force us to, to, to move forward. And, and, and that's good. I mean, I mean but, but Pelishin is not here, so I could try and argue for him. Uh, he, Pelishin might say, well, that's great. What Carson has shown is, uh, is something very important. Uh, but, uh, but we don't know that, in fact, that is uh, what drives imagery. Uh, he could say, suppose you were to damage Area 17. Suppose you were to have a lesion in Area 17, would the person still have uh, imagery? Now, it turns out that the, the jury is, 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 is uh, what's the word? Out. Out on that one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I just do language. I don't do imagery. Um, it's out on that because, uh, because uh, there are patients who have lesions uh, in Area 17 and don't have deficits of imagery. And then there are others who do. Okay, so, so the question becomes, what's going on? Right. Um, so, so the issue is much more complex, perhaps. But I don't want to... I, I, this is not a criticism. This is simply an observation saying um, that, that, that the, I would have put it m more, not so much in terms of actually um, uh, advancing our understanding necessarily of, of, of mind theory in, in all aspects, but, but in the way in which Stephen presented it, that yes, a theory uh, against, say, Pelicians that has a range of predictions that other theory has come very close to having. Okay. And that's important, and that develops all kinds of research that then perhaps can be used to test these theories. So, thank you, Alfonso. I <clears throat> agree with most of what you said. Um, so one of the reasons at the end I pointed out that we've discovered that imagery is not one thing, that there's spatial imagery and there's color imagery and shape imagery and so on, was in fact in response to those data, which I didn't talk about, where he's, you're right, there are some patients who have really damaged imagery when area V1 is impacted and others who don't. But if you look carefully at the tasks, what they're actually asked to do, it turns out they're asked to do different kinds of things. And nobody has yet systematically taken a theory that says there are different kinds of imagery and given tasks can be often done in different ways. 
So we have to design the task very carefully to force them to use one particular system and see if, in fact, damage to the cortex that supports that system results in deficits in the task. So for example, um, I've done patient work too. Uh, I'm, uh, he's got a real green thumb at this, and it, I don't. So I stopped. But um, there was a patient, I see Vern Cavanis out there, I collaborate with some of this on it, um, who had V1 damage. And um, she was able to do some imagery tasks really well. So I sat her down, and I said, OK, let's just go through this. In the order of the alphabet, if you visualize uppercase letters, do they have any curved lines or not? So how about A? So she goes like this. No. OK. How about B? So what she did is she converted a visual task to a spatial motoric task. She was using a feedback loop by actually literally drawing them in the air to get a sense of whether there were straight lines or any curved lines. So it wasn't just there was one way to do the task. So you got to look at the tasks that these patients have been put to, which I have looked at. And the resulting hypothesis, which has got to be tested, is that in fact there are multiple strategies which draw on different kinds of imagery or other kinds of information in some cases, depending on what the task is, and in turn test patients who have specific lesions. So I think the bottom line is there's a dynamic where you come to the table with some ideas. You can use converging methods Neuroimaging being one, testing patients with uh, lesions being another. You look at the results, that refines your theories, gives you new hypotheses, you go back and test them further. And I think that's the sign of a healthy science, where in fact it's growing, it's developing as we refine what we know by making contact with different kinds of phenomena in the context of developing theories. Can I just kind of bring you in this, on this yeah. question by oh. just, just putting one question into it? Um, one of the issues that comes up here is the idea that you find an area that's showing activation through imaging, and then, for example, you don't necessarily find a selective deficit in a patient population. So ca cases, for example, of category-specific deficits where imaging, for example, activates areas that are you know, for tools, but you don't find a tool-specific patient. So maybe just talk about that kind of dynamic. I mean, there's a proxy, but not just necessarily a tool. How do you think about the role of the patient populations and the imaging and how those two can basically well, I think you have to understand why the imaging finding is showing what it does. You always, <clears throat> there's always a concern about epi phenomena in imaging. We, everyone would acknowledge that it's not giving you uh, information, uh, causal information almost by definition. So I think really the only way to get at that is by more refined experiments using things like TN TMS, uh, understanding better what it is that the imaging finding is going to tell you. But I wanted to relate to this discussion just by noting that um, uh, it was, I thought it was interesting that when, uh, when I began, I, I kind of included observations from neuropsychology as part of how the brain sciences have been informed and mind sciences began with a, an example from amnesia. And you were drawing a distinction uh, between neuropsychological observations being fundamentally behavioral. And, and in some sense, I would, I would agree. However, Going back to the point I raised, the third point about, uh, or the point about conceptual leveraging, I think there is something more to the lesion data in many cases than just a functional dissociation that could have been produced by anything. You found somebody who could do one thing and not do it another, not do another, it tells you, it tells you that they've got to be different in some way. And that, in the particular case of memory, I think one of the early kinds of conceptual leveraging that we got was links to animal models that are, uh, for obvious reasons, not going to be as fruitful in language and, and imagery, for that matter. So the fact that it was the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus uh, that was damaged allowed you to then draw on all the work that was going on in the 80s and 90s and con continues to go on in the animal literature uh, and to really build a case that, there, well, there is this system that has some integrity that it critically involves the medial temporal lobes. Uh, and feed that back into claims uh, about different memory systems, for example, being involved in other forms of memory, including, in, including priming. So I think as a, a one general point, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that animal models, behavioral neuroscience have a role here, uh, and, a, and a role very much in the spirit of this discussion of using all the tools and observation where they're appropriate. They're not appropriate or even available, obviously, in many cases. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, it, it turns out that I completely agree with you, and that, that one of the reasons I think imagery is interesting to study is it's very close to perception. Um, over 90% of the same brain area, 
voxels are activated when people's eyes are closed and they're visualizing is when they do the corresponding visual task. So we know a lot about vision from animal models. So we, we knew, I showed you that slide of V1 with the stripes on it, that's from a monkey. And we know a lot about the anatomy, uh, including the fact that there's reciprocal backwards connections, which gives us some idea of how imagery might actually be generated. In fact, we can go into fine structure, the, the details of how the projections look, which gives us inspiration for our theory. So it's true, it's hard to teach animals to have imagery, but because of the close correspondence between imagery and perception, we get enormous leverage off animal models, and that is a big difference between memory and perception. Can I say to something else? The, one of the things that really sobered me about your talk was that slide where you showed what areas are activated during, with nouns and verbs, these little spots, and before that he showed these huge swaths of areas that when damaged resulted in associations. I wondered if by the time you're an adult, your language is so automatic, you just used it so, at least your native language, so often, over and over and over again, that um, it, it's like a marathon runner who has to walk quickly to get to the store, it's just not consuming any more metabolic resources. So I wondered if maybe the tasks weren't challenging enough, getting back to task design, that you really, there wasn't much being activated there. Uh, well, that, that's because I was cheating. Uh, uh, what I was showing you was the difference uh, between uh, nouns and verbs. Uh, the, the little dots were the areas of difference between nouns and verbs. Uh, um, if you look at the activation uh, of the brain in performing the task, uh, it, that was the slide above the one that showed that, that showed a huge swath of activation in the classical areas of language. Um, and, and in fact, one of the one of the one of the techniques that we use in imaging, as you know, is precisely something like this: either subtraction or correlational type of analysis to identify which areas we think are crucially important uh, for a particular aspect of the task that that we're playing with. And that those kinds of that kind of analysis, kind of logic, leads to the kinds of results like the one I, I, I showed you uh, a moment ago. Uh, so, and you know, just like the ones Dad showed you when he looked at the repetition adaptation, again, that is not the whole brain. What he's showing you is just the areas that show that correlate with the decrease in activation um, in that task. So, so these data are highly processed. I mean, I'm not telling you something, you know it much better than I know it. Uh, highly processed and what we then show at the end are just uh, these uh, small bits that we think uh, for various uh, practical and theoretical reasons we've come to believe are the ones that are crucial in the performance of that task. So, it, this, so your failure to find convergence between the brain damage results and neuroimaging you could say as much about the subtraction methodology as about the utility of fMRI per se. Uh, no, I think I think that that uh, it turns out that, that the failure is, is 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 very instructive, and I didn't have time to go into some new methods we're using to actually show that with MRI we get acti we get uh, to, we can show activations in this anterior midfrontal uh, area um, using MRI. So we can get it uh, with particular kinds of techniques. Um, um, uh, the reason I, I was showing this uh, was only to illustrate that in this case, the, the case of say words, uh, you have many many complex circuits that have to uh, that come online at the same time. When I produce a word, I'm not just producing sounds. I mean, there's a whole, I think, I hope, ideas behind the sounds I produce. Uh, and, 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 and those ideas, in, in my case, uh, in producing the sounds, I also have to make sure that they don't come out in Italian. I have to make sure that, uh, that the words come out in the order they're supposed to come out. All of, the, of those processes are incredibly uh, complicated things that, that are going on at the same time. And in, a, in, in, in knowledge of, of, of words uh, includes knowledge of all those things. Uh, and so what, what we were looking at there was an attempt, that, that a poor attempt on our part, I guess, uh, researchers, to try and, and tease apart those complex things. The instrument we're using is too blunt this time. I mean, the instrument we have, and, and we have to admit it, is, is, is so blunt, given what we're trying to explain, that uh, if you were a Martian, you were coming here, you say, I mean, these guys are really, not very good. I mean, it's really behind. Um, uh, they they want to have uh, theories that are cognitive theories are very rich and very complicated, and they're using instruments that at this time uh, today are not able to really get to the thing they're interested in. So so I, I was not trying to be pessimistic, even though I was painted that way. In fact, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I wouldn't be doing this work if I weren't optimistic about it. What I, the, I'm what trying to point you, to just what, what to the difficulties. What makes you optimistic? 
Uh, what makes me optimistic is the fact that, that I'm seeing convergence. The work you described, for example, you, it, it's, it's starting to look like we can get convergence. Uh, for a few years, it looked like we weren't. Uh, it was touch and go. Um, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s, it looked like people, if, if, you're, if, you're, if someone reported one result, uh, there were 10 others that were very different. Um, and, and what is happening over the last few years is, one, people are learning how to use these methods uh, and they're becoming more strict in what methods are appropriate for analysis so that the papers are becoming of higher quality, one. And second thing that is happening is that people, are, I think, are becoming better cognitively so that the controls that are being introduced to try and, and, and perform these experiments are becoming better experiments and so we're seeing more convergence. So that's what makes me optimistic. So can I just, uh, may I a question sort of thinking forward rather than where we are. Uh, given the kinds of um, cognitive questions that you're wrestling with, um, what technologies don't we have? So in other words, you mentioned kind of going down to the genetic level. I'd be curious at that level, you know, what's that going to do to help explain the cognitive questions? But moreover, may, may just think, without going down to the molecular level, what about just within the technologies available to do the brain scientists? What, what are we missing that's constraining the current test that we can currently leverage against, you know, the current cognitive sciences? Well, the, I, I think the, the jump from uh, brain systems to individual neurons is a big one, and conceptually we might get, you know, we might get a very different story uh, coming out if we were able to uh, have the kind of precision that would allow us to record from individual neurons. Now, I'm thinking of this recent paper that just came out in Science and made the uh, uh, front page of the New York Times uh, uh, from the Weizmann uh, and UCLA group where they were doing individual neuron recordings from hippocampus in patients with intractable epilepsy, it kind of came out with what has been, was an extension of kind of a, a grandmother cell story that, that uh, uh, Freed has been building for, for a while, but the, the kind of striking observation was that for reasons that are not entirely clear, uh, some individual neurons within the hippocampus of these patients would respond strongly when they saw a film clip of uh, Seinfeld, uh, but not Tom Cruise, others vice versa, and so on and so forth. And then interestingly, from the memory perspective, these individual neurons, uh, about a second or second half prior to free recall of these film clips, the same neurons turned on, individual neurons. So it's a very impressive kind of coding retrieval overlap or recapitulation that kind of fits nicely with, with some cognitive ideas and neuroscience ideas that have been around for a while. However, uh, whether we like this kind of grandmother cell flavor to some of these findings and whether that's even uh, appropriate interpretation is, is another question. But the fact that we would get such a strikingly different take from looking down there in the individual cells or suggestion of what might be going on is something that intrigues me. And if we had better ways of doing that, uh, I think we, w we might fill out the picture in a very different way. So can, let, me, let, me, let me just push on that. Let me, let me just be a pessimist for a moment and think, I don't care about the neuroscience. I don't only really care about that cell coding for anything. That doesn't change my views about how the brain rep mind represents things. I mean, so I haven't changed my views about memory at all. I, I knew I remembered Seinfeld. I never remember Tom Cruise differently. So now I know that a cell can code for it, so? I mean, the question is, if, <laughs> if, if you're interested in specifically neural function, yeah. mm -hmm. impressed with the way that face cells were impressive when they were first discovered, or the way that cells coding for numerical. I don't think we can The question ask, is, I, I why should I care about the co if I'm a cognitive scientist? Why should I, you know? Maybe you shouldn't. I think it's always the case that there, we can't, I, I, don't, I think it's unfair to ask that every observation that comes out of neuroscience has got to make a cognitive scientist happy who doesn't care about the brain. That's a pretty strict criterion. Now some of these findings may work that way, that one may not, may or may not. It was, but, it was um, more, just let me just reframe the question, maybe Steve wants to, and the, the question was more, not that everything should, but what technologies could you imagine developing that would actually right. change the cognitive right. theory rather right. than, it would, right. I mean, Right. So the, the two kinds of things you've got to worry about, time and space. So we've been focusing on space just now in terms of how small the unit is we can record from, which, depending on what question you're asking, is more or less useful. I mean, if you study bricks, you're not going to learn about architecture, but maybe you're going to get constraints because you can't build skyscrapers out of bricks and not strong enough to carry their own weight. But time is the other piece. So for the kind of theory that I've been developing, which I've not talked about here, there's clear predictions about the temporal order in which different processes should kick in. You should be looking up information about associations before you start to activate stored visual memories before an image appears. 
very clear predictions. We don't have good technology yet that combines both good spatial resolution and good temporal resolution. We have separate technologies that will do both, but don't combine very well. So to my, from my point of view, that's the biggest constraint right now, to, to test cognitive theories that make predictions about ordering in which events should occur, which virtually all theories do. May I, I, think, I, think, okay, um, I, I think Stephen is right, and, um, and the, the beginnings of, of an approach to this, to this is, is already there. The future is already here. People are using multimodal imaging, combining EEG and MRI to try and learn um, uh, about uh, the, uh, the temporal relationship among areas that became activated. One recent study, recent study, a year and a half ago, uh, was able to use uh, the distribution uh, of uh, electrical activity using EEG to identify areas in the brain, spatially, uh, and, and show that, that um, uh, or at least interpret the data as indicating uh, that the, um, the patterns of activation you saw in this static image of the MRI actually had a temporal dynamic that corresponded to that of the, of the, of the EEG. Um, so yes, I think we are, we are getting there. Multimodal imaging is not just something of, uh, in the distant future, it's already here. I, I think there's uh, some interesting observations there related just, just to, to the fact that we have had event-related potential technology around for a long time, electrophysiological mm -hmm. recordings that have considerably better temporal resolution uh, than hemodynamic neuroimaging. Um, they don't have the spatial resolution, obviously, and that's a limitation. But there are people like, for example, Manny Donchin, who's been one of the pioneers in that area for 40 years or more, who wonder, who have wondered why was it the case that cognitive psychology latched on or grabbed on with such excitement to hemodynamic imaging, and they kind of largely ignored ERPs. Uh, or they certainly it did, didn't transform the field in the way that ERPs did, even though ERPs are more relevant, for example, to testing temporal hypotheses. My own opinion on that is that we do have a very strong legacy of classical neuropsychology throughout our field in, in people who have been interested in making the brain, uh, brain mind link, and that has really been aware enterprise, uh, at least for some, some people. And uh, so that there, there are some techniques that I think are potentially useful for temporal issues, but they don't address other aspects that are of interest to many of us. But the ERP has been used in language a lot because unlike, say, m many visual science experiments can be done by flashing a stimulus on, very brief exposure, and then you analyze it. Language, you can't do that. <laughs> it happens over time. And so uh, many, many researchers have turned to, to these uh, more temporally uh, based kinds of analysis using uh, EEG uh, ERPs to try and, and learn about. about uh, that's, that's true, but I think an ERP researcher might be sensitive to the kind of introduction that Mark gave, which would be an entirely appropriate introduction. Well, in 1992, we got these methods that allowed us to look into the brain. Well, they've been looking into the brain with ERPs. But at, with temporal specificity, not spatial specificity. Right, and, and one of the things we're trying to do is uh, to pull the meatloaf apart by its joints. Um, we want to understand the brain systems. No complex cognitive task is done by a single process. It's a, it's a concert. It's a complex activity, any cognitive task, complex activity with lots, as Alfonso pointed out, lots of sub-processes. And it's the spatial re relations among brain areas that are allowing us to start to characterize different, what constitutes different brain systems in a way that just temporal relations can't. And once you've characterized what part of the brain seems to be doing, when it lights up another task, you now have an a priori, priori hypothesis about what may be going on in that task so we can leverage our, ourselves in a way using space, a aspects of the brain, particular parts of the brain that are lit up in a way that you just can't do with event-related potentials, ERP, which is very poor spatial res resolution. You don't know where it's coming from. That's can, I ask, why just, well, maybe, can I just ask maybe one, before we open the, to the floor, may I just ask one more question that was just maybe a little bit touched upon, but I'd like to hear a little bit more, which is um, the way in which now that's the cognitive neuroscience movement is, has begun to take place, the extent to which this now allows a stronger connection with animal studies in terms of animal models that may be actually useful for clinical applications, which we've not discussed today. So that in the early days of the cognitive sciences, except for the neuropsychology, we had very, very poor understanding of how the brain is doing these very kind of cognitive representations. And so when people were 
using animal models, they were so far removed from what we understood about the human brain that the model part was just really bizarre in some sense. So rat models of autism, what does that mean, right? Um, but now maybe that the cognitive neuroscience have begun to pinpoint some of the crucial areas for representations or systems of processing that you can see in animals, does that give us a better way of thinking about clinical issues? And each of you have basically, they're, they're separate issues, but I wonder if you could each speak to that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, made, made dance since you, since you started off with the memory issues. Yeah, well, certainly uh, in, in memory, we, we've had the connection, but I think the connection has, has been strengthened uh, by, by uh, various imaging techniques uh, available. Uh, and I, I, I think what you've, you've seen uh, to some extent, uh, uh, I think an increased integration of, some, uh, of animal models on, on certain issues, uh, particularly, for example, spatial memory, spatial navigation, which is something where you can really start getting almost equivalent designs, and you can do imaging experiments, you can do animal experiments, and those things are discussed side by side now, I think, in a much stronger way uh, than you saw before. Uh, and then clinically, uh, applications for Alzheimer's disease, animal models of Alzheimer's disease, I think, are probably being facilitated somewhat, at least by uh, some of the new imaging techniques. Yeah, so I think I'd say yes. Steve? I wouldn't add anything to what Dan just said. That was good. I mean, you're, I mean, so Alfonso, I mean, you think I think there is no animal model for language. I mean, that's the problem, right? I mean, the animal data has never mean, been there relevant. There are animal models for some things. I mean, Algala Burda had an animal model of dyslexia. I mean, there are, there so are. So what does that mean? What does that, what would that mean? Well, he found it's that there were certain rate. types of, <laughs> certain types of, of, of abnormalities in the brains of, of dyslexic subjects, and he was trying to find out how uh, they came about, and it's very difficult to do in humans, so he turned to rats. And uh, so, I mean, I think you can, uh, if you have a, a clear hypothesis, uh, turn to some specific aspects in the animal model. Clearly, there won't be a model of syntax. Uh, there'll be a model of something that some very basic process you assume to be, say, part of syntax, and then perhaps you might be able to find it in animals. Um, but I wouldn't be, I wouldn't exclude it a priori as it's, it's a possibility. It's just. We haven't been smart enough to think of how to do it, but um, I mean, one of the things that we didn't say is that uh, that the field is changing very rapidly. Uh, it, it's, it, it was it started really as a, as a kind of modern phrenology, and and everyone is just publishing these beautifully colored pictures, and and the uh, New York Times, everyone is sort of every week there was an, another discovery, um, not very deep, uh, but it made the New York Times, and I think more and more. Um, uh, uh, the field is changing that new types of disciplines starting to come in. For example, computer scientists with, with, uh, with the use of, of, uh, uh, of various models, uh, of learning models, uh, uh, trying, to, um, uh, trying to learn to, how to categorize um, uh, particular patterns of activations. Uh, things that, that those of us who were trained in a particular way don't think of. Uh, but, but with the collaboration of these new disciplines, uh, all of a sudden new questions can be asked. So, so if I find something that is activated over here, what does it tell me? Perhaps nothing, but all of a sudden someone is able to actually show that it can predict performance. So it can actually predict whether or not I, I saw a dog. Now in the measure to which these techniques are refined, we may be able to get new insights that may then uh, uh, crack open uh, these various complex systems. Um, we are playing at the, at the phrenology game because that's, that's the level of, of theorizing that we are able to map onto the brain. Uh, but I think that that's changing, and it's changing as, these, as people learn how to use these data in a way that, that, that we did not do before. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's changed a lot and over a number of years since the early 90s uh, when you know, the new phrenology was the kind of uh, vogue criticism of, of neuroimaging. I think mu there's much more emphasis, and I think we heard in these talks today, on individual regions as kind of being nodes in, in, in larger systems, and a lot of the analyses have, have focused on, on that level. So I, I think the, the phrenology thing has kind of been really uh, play, played down in, in a positive sense for a number of years now. Okay, so let's uh, open the floor to question. Jen Jennifer, do you have a question? Yeah, the uh, microphone. Okay, please. I, I, I sorry, it's the microphone. Yeah, um, I have a sort of more general question, which is something like um, we have sort of imperfect brain data and we have imperfect theories, cognitive theories, and I, there must be some sort of tension going between them. And I mean, I wanted to ask Professor Costlin a question, but it's sort of a more general one, but it might seem a bit more pointed towards you. Um, 
So it occurred to me when I was watching your talk, you have this beautiful slide showing this, you know, R of 0.97 for a very beautiful linear relationship for the island data. But then you also show a slide of V1, which has a clear, you know, it's a log relationship there in the representation. Right. And so I'm sort of interested why you see V1 as supportive of your data because there's a representation, but not um, unsupportive of your data because it's clearly not a linear relationship on the cortex. And so, I mean, this is probably a general question for memory and everything else, but I just thought I'd ask you, so how do you decide what is good data and bad, and why does it support your theory and, or not? Right, so the, the, the map data were done well before, that was published in 1978, so that was well before there was any brain stuff. So that, uh, there's, there was a whole set of those experiments. One finding that was interesting was we showed if you had people zoom in so that the rest of the image overflowed, and then scan to information that was off screen, you got the same function. So the idea was that what's going on, it's, it's, it's a, here's an analogy. You're looking at a screen and the camera, and the camera's panning across a scene. On the screen, it's actually sliding across. So the, the notion is you're absolutely right. It's, it's not isotropic. And that, in fact, um, Steve Pinker, when he's a graduate student here, showed there were two kinds of scanning. There was scanning within the screen, as it were, and then there was scanning that was a different system that involved going off screen. So if you close your eyes and you imagine scanning around your bedroom, you don't hit the edge. You don't hit an edge. So in fact, what happened was the original result of looking at that linear result was trying to argue there's a representation there that preserves space. Okay, but the original idea was wrong. The, co the naive cognitive one, there was a picture and you just scan over it, that can't be right. When we looked at the brain, we discovered the fovea is much more represented, so we needed to think of another theory, and then that, that is testable. So it's a perfect example of this kind of use of the brain data to refine the cognitive theory in a way that simply wasn't obvious from looking at the behavioral data. Good, good question. I'd like to ask Professor Schachter, to what extent can patients who've had bilateral hippocampectomy, like Brenda Milner's famous patient, or people who are in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease and have lost uh, short-term memory still make memories of the future? Well, that's a, an interesting question, and that, uh, as an observation that's relevant to what I talked about, I didn't have time to unpack it, but it looks as though they're not very good at that. In fact, there were some early observations on, on, on that score a number of years ago from a very severely head injured uh, patient with uh, frontal and temporal lobe damage in Toronto, KC, who uh, informally, uh, if you would ask him um, about what he, what he was going to do tomorrow, uh, he would come up with as deep a blank as if you asked him what he had done yesterday. Uh, there have been a couple more studies, and a nice one uh, more recently from uh, Hassabis and McGuire published last year that I think has been one of the several findings that have kind of led, led to this area getting very interesting, and, and that they found that four or five patients with a damage restricted to the hippocampus, if you ask them just to imagine novel events, uh, do a very poor job of that, uh, uh, with particularly uh, um, spare spatial coherence, very spare uh, kind of uh, representations of these novel scenes. We've done this with uh, aging. Uh, old, healthy older adults, and you, you get a parallel decline in specificity in remembering the past and imagining the future, and also Alzheimer's disease, not surprisingly, they're, they're even worse. So there's a very striking parallel there in the patient populations that parallel the imaging. Please. Uh, I just want to ask your opinion. Uh, Anton Dimasio has done a lot of work on uh, a brain damage patient. Does it add or subtract to some of the work you have done on the mind-brain and cognition theories? He hasn't been working in memory lately, so I'll take a pass on that. <laughs> what in particular were you focusing on? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The knowledge of the field. Sure. Yeah. No, I don't mean I don't mean to be flip, but well, particularly emotion. He did yeah. some. He and Trinell did some very uh, striking work in the late in the mid '90s, uh, showing uh, interesting uh, sp specific deficits in certain kinds of emotions in patients with amygdala damage. That was one of the parts of the emerging story, linking the amygdala and other 
uh, interconnected regions, specifically to emotional processing, emotional memory. So that was one of you know, many areas where he's worked. He's done a, the prosopagnosia work was elegant, where people who have brain damage sometimes will fail to be able to recognize faces, specifically faces. And he showed that you can get uh, physiological evidence that even when they, they say they don't recognize them, somewhere in the brain it's registering that they're familiar with that face and not other, other ones. That was an, he's done a lot of work. Um, it's, 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 all, <laughs> it's, all, it's also led, I'll, I'll turn it to Alfonso, but it's, all, it's also led to some um, responses of criticism, um, including from a, an ex-student of Alfonso and I, so maybe you, you want to... No, no, I'll, I'll pass on that. But, but he, uh, um, uh, Tony Damasio and and um, and Tranel, uh, uh, many years ago had uh, um, argued that uh, when patients have difficulties in processing nouns and verbs, that the difficulty is one in pr of processing objects and actions, and um, and th that uh, that hypothesis uh, is maybe true for some patients, but as I showed, it's not true for all patients. Um, uh, Damasio has made many contributions, not only to the area of emotion with the somatic marker hypothesis, but to areas like prosopagnosia, where he's made uh, interesting claims there, and language, and, and uh, so yes, he has made many contributions. Liz, you want to go here and then we'll go back to you. So the topic of this symposium is what um, uh, studies in cognitive neuroscience can tell us about cognition, but I think in all three of your talks, uh, we saw beautiful examples of the opposite as well, of how fundamental classic cognitive psychology can shed light on the uh, structure, organization, and function of the brain and give insights that you wouldn't necessarily get, very, that you wouldn't get very easily if you simply took the uh, uh, approaches of classic uh, neuroscience, worked from the bottom up and tried to characterize the different areas of the brain that you guys were talking about in terms of their inputs and so forth, you'd be led to conclusions like uh, V1 is all about vision as opposed to about uh, primarily about vision but also supporting these other functions that you see uh, when you take a cognitive perspective. So in that context, I've got a question. Uh, it, I think that a, 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 a central problem for neuroscience today is bridging between the levels of molecules and cells to the level of neural systems and taking for each of those spots that you see glowing in the brain, going inside and asking how can we use what we understand about basic processes to figure out how any of these systems actually work. My question to you is do you think that in the effort to answer that to, to solve, take on that task, cognitive psychology has a role to play. Whether what we know about how cognition works at micro levels as well as uh, macro levels need, should be added into the mix in thinking about what could that cell uh, be doing in the experiment when it's responding to Tom Cruise and, or someone else. Yeah, I, I would respond simply by saying absolutely that I, I would think that that as we progress and try to make those kinds of links, we, we are, I think we'd be as lost uh, if we did that divorce from you know, cognitive theories and cognitive paradigms uh, as we would have been you know, in, in this enterprise. I don't, I don't see a reason why, in principle, uh, it would be different. So I th I'm, in general, glad that you brought up that point because that's such a fundamental one that could easily be lost in this uh, discussion. That I, don't, I don't think that... Uh, we'd even be talking about the uh, the influence of brain sciences on mind sciences if it were not for the fact that you know the cognitive underpinnings of all this is 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 in place and there is you know a very strong cognitive psychology that allows some of this work to go forward and I think it will be the same in the future. I, I'm not a good enough neuroscientist to answer that question, but I can point to a couple of things that make me skeptical. Um, we didn't talk at all about plasticity. Uh, and we know that there is amazing plasticity that is so fast that it is, it is one trial fast. Uh, in the area of vision, they're able to show that uh, neurons' uh, ability to respond to things changes in one single trial. Now, if that were true, and behaviorally it's true, um, it, it, it makes it difficult for me, and depending on how, how broad this plasticity is, it makes it difficult for me to 
to um, to imagine how at at a level, current level of understanding, this might work. It seems that that the ways in which the brain works is with amazingly many, many millions of neurons working in concert. And we are simply perhaps looking at it the wrong way. That is, we are trying to look at this little area, and for all we know, um, uh, what is important about this little area is the fact that it's not connected to these other things at this particular moment in processing time. So, so, um, I don't think that we are anywhere close to having the kind of theorizing that can address your question. Um, I, I, I simply, again, because of the plasticity, for one thing, because of the connectivity, we didn't even mention the word connectivity. And there are methods that are being used increasingly to try and ask questions about what areas are connected to what areas and how the processing changes the function of that connectivity. Well, um, again, uh, it, it, these are... are, are I think the levels of description are just too too different at this at this point, and and the only answer I can give is say I hope so. Steve, you want to? I hope so too, but I'm more optimistic. Um, I've emphasized a couple of times the importance of task design, and what that's really about is the questions that you pose. So you can, depending on what question you ask, you're going to find different answers. So. When you're dealing with something as complicated as the brain, you have to make choices about what to measure and what to vary and so forth, and you're guided by theory. And one of the kinds of theories that's turned out to be rather useful, at least in my work, has been cognitive theories, where you think about functions. That is, what is this? what do we have to accomplish in terms of processing in order to be able to do a certain kind of task? So when you start thinking at a cognitive level, the level of function, that directs your attention to look for specific things in the machine that implements that kind of processing, which can help you discover whether distinctions you're drawing at your cognitive level are respected, as Alfonso has pointed out, by the mechanism itself. So I, I see a, an extremely important role for theories at the level of architecture to help understand what the bricks and boards are there for. There was a question back there. I'll take one more question, then we'll wrap it up. Back there. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and uh, to the moderator. Um, Professor Karmatsa has made the distinction between classical neuropsychology, which is uh, making, in the general sense, kind of structure and function relationships, and cognitive neuropsychology. And I wonder if the panelists could comment on a parallel distinction in imaging between the kind of old-fashioned, whole-brain, neophrenology type of studies, and now that we have newer methods, you know, starting with ROIs, which do have a temporal component, and moving up through things like fMRI adaptation and um, multivoxel uh, pattern analysis, like you mentioned. Well, I, I think all those things are, are contributing to something that might, <clears throat> might parallel the distinction between classical and cognitive neuropsychology. But I think even more fundamentally, it really goes back to probably the, the Posner-Peterson-Rakel paper in 1988, which was really the first time linking up kind of sophisticated cognitive paradigms and, and theories with the imaging techniques. They had been around. I mean, there, was more, there were more, uh, somewhat more primitive uh, uh, techniques available. There were people within working within uh, uh, tough constraints imposed by the methodology, but doing re regional cerebral blood flow for, for a number of years before that. And of course, the uh, introduction of the O15 uh, approach and the ability to, to look at things in a, in a much tighter time, time slot played a role in the advances. But I think more fundamentally was that initial link with cognitive paradigm. So I think that's personally where the, the break occurred then, and then we've seen a refining now with the more sophisticated methods and more sophisticated application, as we, we heard earlier. But I think it was in place already, that fundamental distinction. I, I think I, I agree with that. I think the, the key distinct, Alfonso, you can correct me, that classical neuropsychology was kind of common sense -ish, ordinary language explanations for the phenomena, whereas cognitive neuropsychology uses sophisticated theory. So you use linguistic theory to help guide your investigations and interpret the results. And I think the parallel case is, is true in, in cognitive neuroscience, that, that the initial studies used rather simple theories to develop their paradigms. And what you're seeing now is the theories are getting more sophisticated, which are driving 
the kind of investigations. The tools help, but they're being used in the service of answering more sophisticated theory-based questions. Okay. Please join me in thanking the panel.